Welcome to Little Steps Big Gains. My name is Elizabeth and in this video we are going to talk about ataxia. Now initially this video was meant for my new friends who have ataxia and are doing my balance challenges with me. But we are exploring so much more. We are going to talk about the cerebellum, what ataxia is, what do we see, why do we see those things, and what are some things we can do about it. So if you have ataxia, I am so excited you're here with me because this video is for you. So let's jump in and get started. First step, the cerebellum. Cerebellum is Latin for little brain, and it's a part of your brain that is responsible for motor planning, planning and initiating movements, balance, equilibrium, and posture. Let's start at the left. Okay, so if I am reaching into a cabinet, along the way, my limb is going to send signals down through the spinal cord to the brain and tell the brain where it is in space. Then the brain needs to decide, is that where it is supposed to be? Because if it is off course, the cerebellum kicks in and sends motor signals to correct the errors. That is called error-based learning. So therefore the cerebellum kicks in to make my movements smooth and reach the intended target. Now, not only does the cerebellum correct those errors, but it remembers them to prevent them from reoccurring in the future. So that is part of motor planning. Now, how is the cerebellum re related to balance, equilibrium, and posture? Well, the cerebellum has a tight-knit relationship with what is called your vestibular system. And if you watched my video called Let's Talk Balance, I break this down. But with the vestibular system, it is responsible for telling your brain and your cerebellum, it's talking to it, about your position in space, especially relative to your head position. So head turns, positional changes. Your vestibular system is taking in that sensory input sending it to the cerebellum, and then your cerebellum needs to adapt and respond. That's called sensory motor adaptation, okay? So that is where that relationship comes in with balance, equilibrium, and posture. It is all related. We are making progress, okay? Hang in there with me. Next, cerebellar dysfunction. Now that we understand how the cerebellum works, that explains what happens when we have dysfunction in the cerebellum, because now we have an impairment in that error-based learning, as well as recalling those errors to prevent them from reoccurring in the future. This explains why we struggle with calibrations along the way if we're struggling, you know, <clears throat> um, adapting to the messages from the vestibular system. That explains the calibrations and that explains that difficulty with that sensory motor adaptation. It all makes sense now. Ataxia. What is ataxia? It's when we have a loss of control of movement correlated with the cerebellum, right? Makes sense. Now there are some, some common symptoms that we see or signs that we see with ataxia. Here are a few. Dysmetria, that is where we over or undershoot a target. Intention tremor, that's where we may be steady at a stagnant position, but as we reach, a tremor kicks in and we lack our coordination, the motor planning there. Does that make sense now that we talked about the cerebellum? Yes. Another thing we struggle with is maybe called a truncal ataxia with some um, oscillations at the trunk. And then another one would be our ocular motor movement. So this is the, the relationship between the eyes and the brain. And think about what we just talked about with the vestibular system. Now those two things make sense, right? So that is some of the reasons we see those things with ataxia. Now let's keep going interventions. Now I did this for my tips for individuals who struggle with freezing, especially with Parkinson's. As a therapist, I start with compensatory strategies. How can we offset this problem, compensate for it? And then remedial strategies. How can we address it? What can we do? So we are going to talk about both of those. All right. So let's start with compensatory strategies. In my video, Let's Talk Balance, we talk about the three systems that make up our balance. We've already talked about that vestibular system, right? Gives our brain feedback about our position in space, especially relative to our head position, okay? Now our other two systems, our visual system, 
our visual system, your visual system, gives your brain feedback about also where you are in space. So if I'm tipping forward, my eyes are going to tell my brain, you are falling, okay? Respond, as well as relative to my environment. They've done all sorts of uh, excerpt or, uh, research articles where they've had people reaching in an environment and then change the environment around them, maybe tipping frames and stuff, and then watching how that affects their balance because it, they're taking away that visual input. Okay, that would be the visual system. Now the second system, it's called our somatosensory system, but basically we're getting input from our limbs. So if I were to tip back, the pressure in my heels tells my brain, you are falling, respond. Okay, so that is that somatosensory system. We're closely knit with the proprioceptive system, okay? All right, so if you struggle with ataxia, you are struggling in that relationship with the vestibular system, aren't you? Aren't we? Therefore, we have to rely on these two guys. And if we rely on them, we need to be careful when one of them are removed. Okay, so let's start with a lot of times we are visually dependent. We rely so much on that vision. How does that apply to real life? What about dark environments, movie theaters, bright lights, situations in which your visual input is removed? that will impair your balance because you've been relying on that. It's kind of like a crutch, okay, taking that away. What about when you can't see your feet? Like if you're carrying a laundry basket or something where you can't see your feet anymore, that's going to impair it, right? Um, what about just all sorts of visual distractions as well? Uh, especially if we're walking through cluttered surfaces, obstacles, we might be looking at our obstacles. How are we going to manage those? and that might make us struggle a little bit. So visual, our visual system. Next is the proprioceptive system. Somatosensory, proprioception, they're all related. We rely on that quite a bit because the other system, especially our vestibular system, is weak. And so holding on to things, touching things really helps. This is a good um, an out, or <clears throat> example, stairs. Because people with individuals with ataxia do not struggle with muscle weakness. It is not weakness. It is difficulty with coordination. So managing stairs is not difficult because of the strength going up. It's difficult because of the motor planning. And that's where a railing comes in just to have that proprioceptive input. So what happens with a curb when you don't have that? That is where we need a friend, a family member, a loved one to put that elbow out and say, I gotcha. Let's do this together. So that we really, really rely on that proprioceptive system and that is where that kicks in. So for my educational segment for this with my patients, I talk a lot, but I sit down and explain the systems if you have ataxia and I explain why we need to be careful because these areas might trigger balance loss. How can we compensate for it, right? <clears throat> another thing that I talk about is another compensatory strategy is an assisted device. A walker, cane, Nordic poles, we'll talk about those using an assisted device to give yourself proprioceptive input. In one of my um, webinars, they actually weighted down the walker and that person actually had more stability with it to the point that when they went home, the family put fishing lures and stuff along the crossbars to weigh down the walker thought that was fascinating. That gave them more proprioceptive input. Slowing down. A lot of times with a taxi, we have this wide, wide base. If you have a, a normal stance, which is about two to four inches, and you weight shift, you understand that it's a little bit easier to advance. If we have this huge wide base, it is very a lot more difficult to advance a step because of that lateral displacement. So a lot of times we start off slow and then get fast and almost ballistic, okay? So slowing down is very, very important. Now, do I want my patients with a taxi to have a, a, a narrow stance? No, because I, you know, maybe we're not ready for that with balance. So we do want that nice wide base, but we also need a little bit more careful when we step. So therefore I kind of talk, let's slow down. What is another compensatory strategy? Well, this has to do with tremors and difficulty with motor planning. And I went over in a video with tips for tremors, and that one was specific to eating. 
But a lot of times when we reach or move our arm, we have these things called degrees of freedom. With every move, my joint makes a new degree of freedom. And so that makes it that much more difficult to control our movements. What if I take away a degree? So what if when I'm eating, instead of being in this position, I tuck my elbow in? Take that out of the picture. That now the elbow is just you know going up and down, right? And what if I stabilize my wrist? And I like wrist cock up splints for feeding sometimes because it takes away, you know, gives that input, okay? It takes away that degree of freedom. That could be an option. So how can we take away those degrees of freedom with maybe tucking or making proximal stabilization? Here's another thing. A patient, young, young guy with MS, struggling with brushing his teeth. So we take the toothbrush, we make it electric. We get a toothpaste dispenser so that way we can just stick it under there and not worry about caps and calibration and a squeezing. Now we lean against the wall that's next to the sink and we trace our hand, we push that toothbrush, that arm next to it, we trace our hand along the wall, okay? I've taken away my degrees of freedom here at the shoulder and I'm giving myself proprioceptive input as to where my limb is in space. That situations, creative things like that. Those are compensatory strategies. Okay, let's keep going. Speech and swallowing. That can often be very difficult for pe people with ataxia because it still requires a coordination of those movements. So what do I recommend? Seeing a speech therapist, um, a specialist. I am not a specialist in this area, so I have recruited specialists. Um, I'm gonna brag, I recruited my sister, who is a top researcher in this area, um, has presented in London, around the United States. She's gonna kill me for talking about her like this, but anyways. I've recruited her and she's going to do a, um, a webinar for me with me um, to talk a little bit about this. Same thing with swallowing dysphagia. So stay tuned for those videos ahead. But for my answer for recommendation for these difficult uh, areas of struggle would be a speech therapy consultation. My program. This was the initial intent of this video was to talk with my new friends who have ataxia doing my program with me and talking to you and explaining as if we're staying after class about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and tips that might make it more beneficial for you. So a lot of things that we're working on and then you can apply this if you're not doing my program, which is okay, find what works for you, but you can apply these to your program, okay? So we're working a lot with our stepping on our hip extensors and abductors because those do tend to get weak, especially the glutes, those three, that nickname for those three butt muscles that kick in for pelvic stability, okay? So we absolutely need those. So we're really fo focusing and targeting on those. Another thing that we're doing is going slow because we talked about really paying attention to those slow movements and guess what? Stopping. Because stopping is an area that's really important to practice and work on if you have ataxia. Stopping. Once again, you can use these in your own program, okay? Another thing I have done for you is we're only doing four repetitions of each exercise. And that is because my friends with ataxia or MS can struggle a lot with fatigue. And this is, if you think about it, man, your body's doing so much work having to calibrate, struggling with that error-based learning, and it can fatigue you. So that's the reason why I'm only doing four is so that you can take breaks in between and not overwhelm us. That is the reason for that. We're doing a lot of um, trunk rotation and flexibility because that is absolutely essential for that range of motion, especially we'll talk about breathing. We're doing a lot of ankle stability together, aren't we? Especially with our, um, our stepping strategy when we're rocking and rocking. Also when we're shifting onto a single leg stance because ankle stability is so important for balance. If we don't have that range of motion or stability, we really struggle with retrieving our balance if we're falling. That is called an ankle strategy. So that is the reason we are incorporating so much of that. Pushing is really great. And that's the reason why we're doing this kind of um, slow movement forward, but then we're doing that modified plyometric back 
because pushing is really good. Not only does pushing help with the plyometric, but it provides input into the floor, doesn't it? So now you're actually not just feeling your foot, but you're pushing back to give yourself that extra input. So important. Another thing that we're doing is a lot of proximal stabilization. And one of the ways we're doing this is through our breathing. Um, I found this fascinating that one of the studies showed that individuals with uh, increased ataxia, it's correlated with increased respiratory symptoms. And they were talking a lot about how important breath work is, especially it's involved in proximal stabilization. We're going to talk about that right after this, okay? Hang in there with me. But that breathing in, expanding that belly with that diaphragm, lowering it, okay, gives you some proximal stabilization. So, so beneficial breath work, okay? So that is specific for my program, why I'm doing some of the things I'm doing for you. Tips, these are tips for you to give you some extra ideas how to take this challenge to the next level for you. If you're not doing my challenge, that's okay. Maybe apply these to your program, okay? Steal them, that's fine. Okay, so number one, counting. And um, we're, we just talked about breath work, right? Breathing in, expanding that chest, and then going one, two, three, four, five. Hang in there with me, because after this we'll talk more about breath work, okay? But one of the CEUs, um, they were having an individual stand up, breathe in, one, two, three, very slowly, eccentrically expanding that chest. We'll talk about proximal stabilization. Hang in there, okay? But that could be a good addition for you. Okay, so if we're struggling with feedback, okay, the, about where we are and what's going on, what is a good way to give yourself extra feedback? For the legs, you can use agility dots. I use these at work with my patients, and I put them on the ground in the rubber. But... um maybe giving yourself a target as to where to step because if you're off that gives yourself feedback about motor planning okay correcting those errors agility dots so these I got online this happens to be world sport Google find your find whatever's you know cost effective for you um, okay so if that's the legs what about the arms now another, one of the things people ask is what about weights does weights give my brain feedback well if you think about it, we want feedback towards the brain, not away. And so the research is limited on weights because now you're taking the feedback this way, you're almost distracting the limb as opposed to compressing it in. So the research is up in the air about this. Now, if you have a therapist that's using weights, that's okay, try it, maybe they're experimenting. Is weightlifting bad for you? No, because you're working on strength, okay? So weightlifting is good, but what I'm saying is if you want to use weights for input, for proprioceptive input, that's kind of a question mark. But what's not a question mark is bands, because now if you have a band, okay, and you're punching out, see how that proprioceptive input's coming towards us, especially for that eccentric control. So bands are a great option. I'm going to do a whole video segment on how you can use bands in my program, especially the sitting one. If you are interested, I'm going to make it for you. Okay, so that might be the arm. What about what are some other ways to give feedback to your arms or your your limbs? I was thinking about you and I thought lasers. Okay, I have used lasers in the past, but um, I got these on Amazon. I got the button ones, um, although my patient had a hard time with buttons, so I taped it for him. But, good, they're sleeping. But watch what happens if I use a laser. I don't know if you can see that in the video. Okay, there we go. Good, they're sleeping, because they chase these things around. Um, but you can do your exercises with a laser in your hand and give yourself some feedback okay about where your limb is so that way if your limb is off kilter if it's off you know course maybe that will give your brain feedback about where it is and, and help that cerebellum correct those errors remember we talked about error-based learning so adding lasers might be a great thing for you with our program or steal my idea and use them in your program this is about you not about me all right those are a few tips just for you now let's talk about interventions outside of my program.
remediation. These are interventions to remediate the problem. We talked about compensation. Now let's go to remediation, okay? So the first thing is, it's just so interesting, there's some research on what's called motor priming. And this is where you, the priming means that you change a behavior based on a previous stimuli. Now, the stuff I've been reading is things like success cycling ahead of time before you're doing motor tasks priming the system. Now in one of the webinars they had individuals actually taking TheraBalls and squeezing the TheraBalls and what they're doing is kind of priming core and lower extremity activation. So that might be something to try as well, just priming the system. Other aerobics could be walking, boxing ahead of time. We'll talk about boxing as being very good, but maybe priming the system first. Something to try, right? Another thing that is really, really big hat out there that has a lot of research to support it is balance-based torso weighting. Weighting proximally at the torso, okay? This is really big in the therapy world via weighted vests. And one of the, I thought it was fascinating because one of the research studies weighted the individual asymmetrically. In other words, more on one side based on the, um, the side that they lose their balance more. So fascinating, right? Now what I wanted to know, because the research I've known has supported weighting um, in terms of improved stability in a static stance, improved gait, motor planning in a dynamic stance, but what about after the sessions? And that is where the research shows that these individuals had improvement in later sessions with walking, gait training against perturbations, even without weighting. Ah, so that's so amazing, okay? So what I have at my job is, I contacted a friend of a friend who works in a dental office, and I called her up and I said, hey, if you get any defective x-ray vests or old ones, will you donate them to me? Because x-ray vests have weight to them. And she donated some, so I have those, which was a cheap creative option, right? But um, in the actual study, they used um, weighted vests that were about one to five pounds. So weighting there. <clears throat> I've had heard of people approximately weighting with belts. Um, I've heard about um, abdominal binders. I'm, I've never kind of tapped into abdominal binders or looked at the research on it, but I'm just sharing them. Okay, so that is a really interesting thing. Balance-based torso weighting proximal stabilization that you could try. Put on a weighted vest during exercises, either ours or yours. Um, another thing that we already talked about is adding bands. And then um, something that has a lot of research is Tai Chi because of the slow movements. Pilates for the core and spinal stabilization of also very good um, remedial strategies. Now in one of my motor uh, neuro, neuro, neuro courses, we talked about ocular motor retraining, especially if you have difficulties or dysfunction with the vestibular system. And they recommended apps, there are some free apps, but they can work on smooth pursuits, going back and forth, saccades, which is where you're jumping back and forth, um, um, uh, accommodation, switching back and forth, convergence, fixation, keeping your eyes fixed on a target. Now, I also have worksheets I've created for my patients in this that they can do on their own. Apps are great because you get diversity and you can take it with you. But if you want my my actual programs, email me and I'll send it to you because I created them for that reason. So eye exercises are really good. And then breathing, okay, we talked about that, that research that supports respiratory systems and um, breathing. And does not make sense now that we talked about proximal stabilization, expanding, lowering that diaphragm, expanding, taking the oxygen in with that lung expansion, getting more proximal stabilization. And that's where the counting came in, right? Breathing in and then one, two, three, four, five that the research is there. Interesting, right? Okay, let's keep going. Balance training. This is very difficult to recommend balance training for somebody who has ataxia because of the high risk for falls. So as a therapist, am I putting somebody at risk for falls by recommending balance? But if I don't recommend it, are they ever gonna make improvements? So that's where we need to make modifications in the house. And I talked about this in my safety video for um, the standing balance challenge, but maybe creating a balance station for you. The back of a couch next to a wall in a corner, finding ways where you can create boundaries around you might be a great way to add safety to do some balance exercises. You can take my agility dad idea, have your hands hovering a couch, 
holding on to a couch, something surface, a uh, stable, <laughs> and uh, maybe doing some target training on agility dots, maybe doing some laser training for reaching, maybe doing some bands, okay? Those are some ideas, but creating a, a safe place of boundaries, making a balanced station. Now, one of the things I did at my facility is I had maintenance hook in a coat rack or a a coat hanger um, into the wall, okay? And then I tied TheraBand to it. So I could have my patients walking away from the TheraBand against resistance, and I could be next to them or in front of them. Another thing, since it's hooked to the wall, I can have them punching against resistance, okay? I can have them step and punch against resistance. I can do some more activities. I can have them pull against resistance. So you could always hook, you know, steal my idea with that. But the thing is you have to make sure your bands are, you know, up to date that they don't break on you. And then you may wanna make sure you definitely have those boundaries in case you lose your balance. Just throwing ideas out there. But balance station, adding bands, very good ideas there. Um, another thing that has a lot of research is fast, high intensity. Boxing is a great idea. They have um, a lot of programs specifically for boxing with Parkinson's. But um, so you can Google that. There is a, a organization that started in Indiana called Rock Steady Boxing. But they've expanded. Google them. Google other boxing programs classes high intensity cycling try high intensity programs and things that can also be really really good for you core strengthening essential you can do supine to sit exercises that's where you go from laying to sitting laying to sitting what i'll do is i'll have my my patients go from laying to sitting and i'll put my hand up and then i want them to hit the target lay sit hit so now it involves a little bit more high intensity a little bit of target training makes it a little bit more fun sit to stand working on power on the way up and then slow eccentric control on the way down it's very good to include glute exercises for pelvic stabilization so on the top squeeze those glute muscles okay lots of research on um on gluteal squeeze and um they call it uh just isometric um muscle activation there so that is also really really good um and then along with resisted walking um I haven't read any research on this, but it makes sense to maybe walk in a pool against water because now think about it, you're getting that input around you with the water resisting. And every single morning I'd go to the gym and swim and I was part of the club. There was, um, it was obvious, it was an older group and then me. And uh, every morning get together before work, so much fun. So maybe try getting the gym membership and walking in the pool against resistance because that really it provides that, that stabilization that could make that a great challenge for you. Other ideas. I've already showed you how you can use bands for the upper extremity. What about the lower extremity? One of my courses laying down, <laughs> laying down, had this individual holding his band and he was doing leg circles. And why was that so great? It provided pelvic stability and brought input upwards. So you can do band exercises for laying too, uh, it, for the legs and laying too. Uh, another thing is putting people or, or helping people into quadruped. That's when we're on our knees and arms um, on either a yoga mat or we do a mat table at work. Doing exercises there, you can look up a bunch. I use my agility dots and I put them out and I say red, green, and we put our hands red, green, blue, purple, blue, purple, back and forth. And that's great for muscle co-contraction, proximal stability, core strengthening. So quadruped exercises, if you can get up and down safely. Another really important intervention is incontinence management. Pelvic floor strengthening for individuals that struggle with that and urge incontinence rushing to the bathroom. And so I have a program I'm uploading called, uh, well, I don't know the name, but it's incontinence management. It's a 30 day program. So um, stay tuned for that if you're watching this before it's already uploaded. And then band exercises. I have a program that I'm uploading a lot. Maybe it's already uploaded if you're watching this late, but um, it's called Let's Band Together. So, so th there are other programs as well outside of me that you can maybe look into for incontinence management or fun things with bands. Now, is there anything in the literature about providing home programs for individuals with ataxia, finding improvements in motor control with walking? Yes. 
check out Amy Bastian because she's a researcher that has a lot of great stuff on ataxia. But she did a, a really good study where she had individuals with ataxia do a six week program that started with static sitting, moved to dynamic on like a Theraball, static standing, moved to a dynamic with a, um, like a, a foam pad, and then um, moved to standing and then stooping and stepping working our way up. Now by doing this six week program where these individuals were not walking, did it show improvements in walking? Was there a carryover? Yes, there was. Very interesting. Now do therapists recommend walking to improve walking? Absolutely. Okay, that's like a task oriented training. However, this study showed that you can still do safe exercises, working on core stabilization, pelvic stabilization. You can still work on these things and make improvements that carry over to walking. So you are safe. I just wanna share that because that is really important to know. And that was an interesting study. I'm putting the link in the description in case you're curious about what they did because they, they didn't have a lot of equipment. So if you're saying, what's that program? Check it out, the, the link is in the description. You are amazing. If you are here with me listening to my voice, it means you're an amazing, remarkable person that is hungry for knowledge and willing and motivated to take care of themselves. And that makes you so amazing and remarkable. So uh, just know that if you're still listening to me here. Um, I do hope if you have ataxia that you found something educational and especially applicable. Um, if you, I would love it if you would check out my programs. If not, steal these ideas for your program. This is not about me. This is about you but I'd love it if you would subscribe even better than subscribing I'd love it if you would share share with people that you feel might be in need because I want to create resources but I can't get them out without people helping me share so um, please do that and I am so excited you're here thank you for joining me together little steps every day we can make some big gains